and to have a um, conference with, with you present in the room, not just for two. So thank you very much to all of you. So my is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Indeed Thomas. Uh, I'm a think tanker, um, but also, I mean, originally uh, a university uh, researcher. I worked at the College of Europe, and I'm to you today uh, at uh, Sciences Po Paris. Um, when it comes to talking about the, the green recovery, I just wanted to stay back so we uh, understand what was the debate originally. Uh, so, uh, March 2020, most of Europe went under the lockdown, and at that time there was the idea that we should have, uh, you know, kind of, you know, classic Canadian approach to macroeconomics and invest money in the short term in order to boost the economy. At that time, we had conflicting narratives um, in the EU. Um, First, we were in March 2020, so we had no clue really whether this was a short-term economic crisis or a long-term one. Most policymakers kind of projected a uh, previous economic crisis on that one, even if that one was obviously extremely specific, uh, and we see that today, uh, because it was a crisis that was provoked by you know, uh, uh, health policy measures uh, that were shrinking uh, the supply side of the economy first and, uh, first and foremost. Another key element of the narrative at the time was to what extent we wanted this recovery to be controlled by the EU, the European Union, and which specific body inside the Union, to what extent it should be, it should be national uh, actors using obviously national money, but also EU money. And then finally, the one that is the most relevant to our topic here to the Green Deal, is, was whether we should try as much as possible to build back the 2019 economy, or whether we should use that opportunity to prepare for uh, you know, the 2030 and the 2050 economy. So those were the big uh, political questions that were uh, quite central to the Brussels debate uh, in, um, in, uh, well, in 2020. I just want to focus on that side of the question uh, now. Uh, and by the way, I mean, uh, this is entitled on the Green Deal. I will only talk about climate, uh, which is a big part of the Green Deal, but obviously, as you know, there are other dimensions to the Green Deal, such as the economy, uh, biodiversity, uh, etc. So, let's just try to uh, spend a minute uh, to try to understand what a genuine green recovery would have looked like. For that, we need to understand what we need to do today in order to prepare for the 2050 world from a climate perspective. The best way to summarize that is this graph taken from the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, that provides the best, um, let's say, synthesis of scientific understanding of climate change. This graph was published in 2018. What they show you here is first the evolution of, by the way, let me ask you that question first. Um, did anyone already see that graph ever before? No, okay, good to know for me. Um, <laughs> only with you. Sorry? Yeah, only when you did the online presentation. Okay, okay. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's quite uh, used by climate scientists quite, quite a lot already. Um, so, um, what you see here first is the increase of carbon dioxide emissions uh, throughout the last decades, uh, starting in the 70s, where we know that you know, emitting carbon dioxide actually harms the climate by a large extent. So, despite that scientific knowledge, collectively, as humankind, we chose nonetheless uh, to increase those annual emissions of carbon dioxide. And here, the IPCC shows you how those carbon dioxide emissions happening globally should evolve if we want to limit global climate change or, let's say, global warming to 1.5 Celsius degree, which is still, after the COP26 in Glasgow, the official stuff, so, I mean, just ink on paper, really, but that's still the official goal or keep global warming below 2 Celsius degrees. And I just want you to reflect a second um, about you know, the magnitude of the change. If we really want to change our economy in a way that avoids a climate disaster, we need to reduce, well first we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, not increase them. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions is something that we have not done ever, structurally, throughout human history, or at least recent human history, so I'm here I'm just talking about the last 250 years. Uh, we actually did that in the 16th century by eradicating uh, the almost entire population of the Americas, but putting that aside. So we need to reduce greenhouse gas emission, first and foremost. Second, we need to reduce them by around 5% every year. 
every single year for the next 20 years to get to carbon neutrality by 2040 if we want to stay below 1.5 Celsius degree. If we are less ambitious, if we accept um, a climate change that is catastrophic but not highly catastrophic, so if we go beyond 1.5 but stay below uh, 2 Celsius degrees, here we, the reduction, the annual reduction rate needs to be around 3% rather than 5%. Okay. So obviously, if you want your economy to go from you know plus two percent greenhouse gas emission every year to minus three, you need radical changes, really radical changes. So this is what the EU did, at least as a plan. Uh, the Commission first said, okay, let, let, let's build a narrative for that, and the narrative was uh, to say, okay, there are two transitions that are already ongoing in European societies: the green one and the digital one and we should accelerate them, so we should press fast forward on those transitions that in EU jargon are presented as the twin transitions. Um, the term twin transitions is I mean, intellectually nonsensical, uh, it's just something that was coined by the Commission, it's part of the Commission propaganda, because they know that the green stuff will talk a bit more to um, let's say, uh, here I'm going to oversimplify, we'll talk to a bit more to the centre and the left of the political spectrum, while the digital one will talk more to the right of the political spectrum. So the concept of the twin transition is a PR concept, it's not something that makes sense actually when you look at uh, the, the dynamics of the transition that are extremely different. They just happen to be happening at the same time in our society. Then, um, everybody agreed that EU states should be allowed to, or should be able, rather, enabled to borrow money to support national economies. So each state did borrow a lot of public debt during that crisis to finance national budgets. On top of that, there would be uh, the EU supporting that, especially through a, a, a very new and historic uh, a decision to borrow almost 400 billion euros uh, in EU debt to give that in the form of EU grants to national budget. And that's really the, the key element here that was very, very, very new in terms of EU action. This debt would be paid back mostly in the 2030s and in the 2040s. And why this would be happening? The Commission would be proposing Green Deal policies, so regulatory, regulatory policies that we are going to talk about, the so-called Fit for 55, that has been partially presented in July uh, and the next proposal should come uh, next week. So, how would a green recovery really look like? One way to approach that is to use what you have here, which is a Venn diagram. So what you have in blue are all the projects that can provide macroeconomic stimulus, because from a political perspective, the, the decision was to prioritize uh, you know, GDP growth. That's the priority number one of the EU recovery plan. So that's what you have in blue. What you have in yellow here are all the stuff that are absolutely vital to build a clean energy future, to try to have a chance in order to uh, have a chance to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions globally by, by at least 3% every year, every single year for the next 30 years. And what you have in green, you know, green is the color that you create with blue and yellow, uh, are the kind of projects that do both. So, when we look at what happened in terms of national recovery, there was a lot of blue one. There were a lot of stuff that were you know, non-targeted support to all companies, including polluting ones. Uh, non-targeted support also to the car making industry, also uh, uh, subsidizing the purchase of polluting SUVs. So this was very, very much a big part of the national and also some part of the um, EU, EU funding going to those. Um, the yellow stuff, we don't need to invest in them as part of the recovery. We need long-term strategic investment for stuff like research and development, uh, deployment of offshore wind turbines, all those kind of stuff that are absolutely vital to tackle climate change, but that do not trigger a macroeconomic stimulus in the short term. And then what you have in green are running out charging points for electric vehicles, renovating houses, changing heating system, all the stuff that we did to some extent, but we could have done much more uh, in 2020 and 2021 uh, in order to ensure that the recovery is indeed. So as a conclusion, 
Um, maybe let's stay on that. I mean, if you need to, to remember just one sentence from my presentation is that uh, what we saw happening since 2020 is a greener recovery, not a green recovery. It's greener because it's far better than the last recovery program that was adopted uh, in 2009. But it is not a green recovery. It is not something that is fit for purpose to fight climate change effectively. It's something that is able to slow down the rate at which we are degrading the climate, not something that is able to, uh, to stop uh, the, the harm we do to climate and therefore to ourselves. So when looking at uh, where we stand today, uh, so there are 27 member states in the EU, 22 of them already have a national plan that was submitted and agreed by the Commission, uh, including France and Germany, for instance. Uh, they, they had to make sure that they would invest at least 7% of the EU money uh, to uh, green investments, and this threshold was uh, a bit overshot at 40%, so that's, that's positive. What happened essentially, and here France is a good example, uh, is that national countries decided to do the national recovery program and then submit to the EU all the green bits. So for instance, France had a 100 billion recovery program. They had around 30 to 40 of green investment, depending on how you account for green investments. And they put all that in the plan that they submitted to the EU. So it means that this figure just reflects the, the share of the EU money that goes to green. If you look at uh, EU plus national money, it would be around 20% only. Meaning that the 80% is either polluting or at least not uh, in favor of, uh, uh, of climate change. Uh, we have four uh, national plans that are still to be validated. So that's Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland and Sweden. And one plan that has not been submitted yet, the Netherlands, for whatever reason, maybe Louis, you can enlighten us on that, I don't know why. But anyway, maybe the, the Netherlands does not need EU money, I don't know. Uh, so, yeah. So, in a nutshell, that's much better than the last recovery, but still insufficient to tackle climate change. What are the next steps? Um, if we really want the EU to act on climate change in a way that is uh, decisive, you know, that is really fit for the Green Deal, we need an EU wide long term investment plan not a short-term recovery stimulus. So what I, just to give you one <coughs> order of magnitude, we need the EU to borrow every year the equivalent of 1% of its GDP, only 1%, every year for the next 25 years. Put that money in an EU pot that is able to finance national plans to tackle climate change. If we do that, we have essentially solved the public financing issue for climate change won't be a silver bullet, but at least we, we can solve that part of the puzzle. Um, ideally, that will also help member states to have a multi-annual approach to national climate investment, something that is not happening now. Uh, for instance, we know everything, or we know quite a lot about the next French national budget for climate for 2022, but not for 2023. <laughs> So if you want uh, companies and investors to adapt, you need to give them predictability. One way to do that is to at least push for member states to adopt uh, multi-annual frameworks for public investment for climate. Uh, one way to do that would be to uh, ask them to, to, to do something that uh, is fit with the political mandate of each member state. Uh, so that would be four years in Germany or five years, uh, five years in France. And I'd be ending on that. Thank you. I'm, I'm a bit worried when you say that the twin recovery is just a PR exercise. We're trying to convince our colleagues that there were you know, a little bit of money to be gained for green as part of the digitization agenda. So if you tell us it's just PR and not working, um, we'll talk about it later maybe, but uh, it works. Well, I can, I can tell you just in 30 seconds on that. It's just the, the two drastically different transition. The digital transition is happening on, on very short-term investment. Uh, so the return of investment in a startup in, in tech is like two to four years max. Uh, and it, it is mostly, mostly a technology-driven transition where the policy making is always lagging behind. The green transition is something that is pushed by policy. Uh, so it's a totally different political dynamic. So calling them true transition, and that transition happening at the same time and you have synergies, of course, but they're not Thank you very much. Um, so this 
quick transition towards uh, Luis Fontrack's uh, presentation. Um, I don't know if you want to present a PowerPoint or if you want to go forward a bit. Um, and um, we'll listen to you for 10 minutes, 10 drop minutes. And, yep. um, <coughs> That's fine. I didn't prepare a PowerPoint presentation, uh, but I prepared something on my computer, but if I start reading it, then you will be able to sleep, so I won't do it, so I just synthesized the four points that I wanted to talk about. Uh, I was a bit late because I was sent to the third floor, but I could use my new smartwatch for that. It was St. Nicholas Day in the Netherlands, so we already had our Christmas presents. Um, so my husband will probably be very happy that I did some exercise, extra exercise today. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, why are there only 26 uh, uh, recovery plans submitted and why is the Netherlands still missing. I think it's also very exemplarious for the Netherlands sometimes doing, agreeing to things in Brussels which they later will regret with regards to their own national implementation. Uh, then I wanted to talk about uh, uh, the green recovery as part of this overall European Green Deal story in the Fit for 55 package, but let's say all these fields where the EU institutions are now, let's say, integrating the green agenda into mainstream uh, policy making. Uh, maybe a little bit uh, discussing how green are the uh, uh, resilience and recovery plans and what more uh, could be done. So first of all, the story of why there isn't a Dutch plan. Uh, and I thought, how on earth am I going to explain that? Uh, because it's rather strange, you know, that there's nearly 6 billion being reserved for even subsidies. I mean, okay, the Netherlands doesn't want to have the loans, okay, but even the subsidies they didn't make a plan for. Uh, and and um, <coughs> that you didn't submit it. And I think a key reason is the Dutch situation in the housing market and it has to do with mortgages and, and tax benefits for people who have mortgages. So I'm actually also a homeowner in the Netherlands. I also have a mortgage. On the mortgage I pay annually interest rates. And these interest rates I can reduce from my income tax. So indirectly that's a subsidy of people who own houses. And the more taxes you pay, so the more income you have and the bigger your mortgage is, the more subsidies you get uh, for, uh, for, for your situation. So implicitly it's a bit of a subsidy for the rich <laughs> and also the current uh, people and, and partly as a result of this we also have a very overheated uh, housing market in the Netherlands. Uh, and this is a reason why in the European semester the European Commission has constantly told the Netherlands, and also the, the, the Dutch Central Bank sometimes says it, that this system needs to be reformed. And there were some small adjustments made, but in essence the system is still in place. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons, or probably the most important political reason, why there isn't still a plan. Because now the Commission has also said if the Netherlands wants to have this you know, 6 billion euros, then you have to submit a plan. Uh, but you also have to submit the reforms that accompany it, because that was one of the conditions for the Netherlands. The Netherlands said, we only want to give money to other countries if uh, they reform their labor markets, their bureaucratic procedures, their whatever. So a lot of criticism on what other member states had to do, not in taking into consideration that in the Netherlands probably also some things need to be changed. And there's a, few other examples, for instance, with self-employed people that get tax benefits but also are not very socially secure, which is considered a, an economic um, risk. And because we don't, we only have a, a missionary government, so uh, we had elections in March, but there's still no coalition agreement for the government. The, the, the government, current government says this is a political decision because these reforms will be fundamental. So it will have to be for a real government. And hopefully we will have one before Christmas. Who knows? <coughs> I'm not <coughs> entirely convinced, but uh, and also then not sure how stable it's going to be, how long lasting it's going to be. But it's going to be the same liberal center, center right, if you wish, uh, uh, constellation of political parties. So also the ones where the richer homeowners vote for. Uh, so, uh, uh, I think the, the issue of is this system going to be changed 
with also in the past years a lot of people buying, having bought expensive houses with high mortgages, so running into immediate problems if the system is going to be changed. It's going to be tricky. Well, then the climate change you mentioned, which is most likely also something the Dutch has pushed for hard, uh, and this is also something we do in the Netherlands. We're not having a super good track record when it comes to uh, renewables in the Netherlands, but we pushed very hard for the European Green Deal, we pushed very hard for uh, uh, the 55% emission reductions in 2030 compared to 1990 levels. Uh, we pushed very hard for climate change as a target in the EU budget. Uh, if we're going to make it subsequently in the Netherlands, I don't know. Uh, but it's in any case something that was uh, uh, very much uh, supported. But I guess even more, uh, this is the case for the EU institutions. So Thomas was just telling about uh, the green re recovery ID, uh, and I think also how I have observed it uh, is that uh, the Green Deal and the Green Deal <laughs> thinking of the EU has survived the COVID crisis. So it started in 2019 yeah, with the von der Leyen Commission. The Green Deal became really the new, uh, the new policy talk, uh, the new uh, European storyline of the European Commission. And it is not that the EU was not already championing climate change policy before, because it was. The EU has always been very ambitious. But before, we did it because we cared about the environment. <laughs> I say it a bit uh, uh, plain, but before 2019, before this commission, we cared about climate change, the climate crisis. Since the von der Leyen Commission, we have put a kind of ideological idea, we have fully embraced that, that if you uh, invest in the green transition, you strengthen your economy, you become more competitive in the world. And this is also a story, by the way, that resonates in the rest of the world. The rest of the world takes the EU's climate change policy way more serious than previously. Previously we did it because we wanted to save the planet, now we do it because we want to become a front runner on uh, green technologies. We want to show that we can reduce our dependencies on fossil imports, yeah, because the EU still for a large extent is a fossil importer, importer of gas, oil and coal. Um, and this idea about a, a growth, an economic growth strategy that integrates uh, ecological uh, transition thinking um, is, well of course you could have put questions to it, but it is very much at the heart of the thinking of the European institutions, the European Commission and the European Parliament. Of course, in some fields it's less developed. Yeah? Let's say in agriculture maybe it's less <coughs> developed than in other fields. But more or less, uh, all the fields of the European Union, all the instruments are kind of greenwash is not the right word because then you say it's not actually happening, but they are actually greened. Yeah? So if you think about the uh, multi-annual financial framework where 30% of the spending has to be green, the recovery funds 37%, but also the, the Global Gateway that was just launched last week, uh, the Endiki instruments, uh, the Horizon programs, everywhere you can see, let's say, these green fingerprints uh, and, and, and indeed the, uh, the twin transition of green and digital, sometimes also linking the two, huh? because in the kind of tech battle between Silicon Valley and uh, China. Maybe the combination of green and digital are still fields where the European Union could uh, uh, make a difference, prosper, stand a chance of uh, making a contribution. So thinking about green hydrogen, battery technologies, smart grids, well, lots of these uh, issues. So. Yes, the green uh, recovery survived, so it was not automatic. Eh? What we saw with the COVID crisis, that a lot of countries started to support their national airline companies, their national car manufacturing companies. They did whatever it took to keep their economy going, in a way. Um, but especially from the European level, uh, the emphasis was made on, uh, on uh, highlighting the need for the green recovery. 
somehow green are the, um, are the plans that have been uh, agreed upon and submitted. Well, of course, it depends who you ask. Huh? If you look at the Bruegel publication that just came out, it's pretty okay. I think Thomas in your presentation has also looked relatively okay. If you ask, for instance, the Green Group in the European Parliament or uh, the Green Recovery Tracker from uh, E3G and the Wuppertal Institute, then they say, well, in reality, they say it's green. But they still fund, for instance, uh, a transition from coal to gas. Yeah. And indeed, if you use gas instead of coal to warm your houses, then you need less emissions. But in the longer term, you still have emissions and you don't go to this zero emissions. And even though the EU only says it wanted to be climate neutral in 2050, if we still all heat our houses with gas, then I don't think climate neutrality <laughs> Uh, uh, will become a reality. So it's not, you know, the jury is uh, still out. Um, but in any case, it doesn't really seem to be in line with the great thinking of, hey, if we invest massively in the energy transition, the clean energy transition, then we become economically stronger. Then you would probably expect a little bit uh, more of an effort from <coughs> all the EU member states and not only the usual suspects, Germany, France to a lesser extent, Scandinavian countries, I mean they have relatively green recovery plans, the rest. But anyways, I, I guess it's also understandable if you see, let's say, what happened in other countries with the Covid crisis, in France is their health sectors. Um, uh, but if we really want to leapfrog ourselves out of the crisis in a green way, then possibly more would be necessary. So then, what more could be done? Uh, the last point on my list, um, uh, what more could be done? I think there is still a lot of opportunities to link uh, the plans to the, uh, for instance, to the national energy and climate change plans that the countries also have to submit uh, to consider uh, how uh, the social climate change uh, fund contributes also to green recovery, uh, how uh, uh, other, uh, if there's not a transfer from, for instance, the cohesion fund parts that are green to the recovery plans, eh, just to make the target, uh, to, to tick the box of the 37%. Um, 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 so that, that could be uh, still options. Um, and also to think a bit more perhaps about uh, let's say how this green recovery is situated into the overall um, uh, economic situation in the EU. For instance, in the Netherlands, to go back to my own country, uh, one of the biggest challenges for facing the energy transition is now also simply the labor market that's overheated. With inflation, which makes everything way more expensive, the material shortages in the <coughs> renovation sector, so let's say other policy fields that are also requiring uh, an upgrade to really make the green recovery a reality. All right, I'll stop here and um, I look forward to the next presentation. And if there's questions, I'm going to answer them. We do have a bit more insight about why the Netherlands don't have a plan, but then we'll then continue working on some countries that may have a plan, but may not a perfect one. And uh, this is what uh, we'll be hearing from Grégoire Chauvet Le Drian, who will be telling us about how this recovery plan plays out at the national level and what it means for the European Investment Bank in terms of development. Thank you. In 10 minutes' time, let me be a little bit provocative. Um, Actually, I, what we, we heard today and what we heard from media and so on, we have the impression that Europe discovered, European citizens discovered two worlds, green and EU financing capacity. Let's consider it one word. So, in 2019, it was as, and then with the crisis, it was as if we discovered these two concepts as the new European concepts. Well. Yes and no. Um, EU financing capacity uh, actually, and um, sorry, there is another word, the third one, Eurobonds. 
new capacity, financing capacity, actually with the treaty of Rome, Rome Treaty, 1957, the, the six uh, EU member states uh, have decided to launch a bank. Uh, the name was, and uh, is, always European Investment Bank to invest into priorities uh, for the EU. And there are four priorities uh, infrastructure, SMEs, innovation, and environment. <laughs> Just in two words, innovation, it's potentially thanks to the RIB that we are all there uh, because the IB did finance in 2019 one enterprise which became famous which is BioNTech. Great. And this is EU financing. Nobody knows, that's a problem, but we are there also to finance such, such a project. Environment, and this is our main issue today. Uh, EIB, European Investment Bank, was dedicated 20% of its activity to projects with a climate positive impact. What does that mean in terms of figures, in terms of amounts? EIB today is about 70 billion each year. And 25%, and this is a commitment we, we propose uh, during the COP21 in Paris, represent about uh, seven, 16 billion each year. And it was before 2019, before any ambition, uh, any Green Deal ambition. However, in 2019, this bank considered with the member states who are the shareholder of this institution, of this institution, European institution, they decided to change uh, the IB to become the EU Climate Bank. This is why, because the Green Deal was, uh, everybody was thinking about the Green Deal, so the IB become, is becoming, let's say, the EU Climate Bank. And sorry, before that, in 2007, the IMB launched the first uh, green uh, bonds, which is now perfectly um, famous for the market, but in 2007 it was a first experience. So the green, green bonds. First green bonds emission. So we, we've proposed to our, our member states, uh, to the 27th member states, that EIB uh, becomes the uh, EU Climate Bank with three main objectives. First of all, to exclude the fossil fuel project. Secondly, to double our activity, because 25%, we propose 50%. And thirdly, what we call the Paris Alignment. Which means, which means that none of the projects that could be financed by the IB would have a negative impact on climate change, on climate. 50%, what does that mean? And you will see what, what I mean in terms of uh, communication and po political communication. We were about 16, 16, so potentially we will reach 32, 30, 33 billion each year of capacity of investing in project with a positive impact on climate. As we never finance a loan a project, uh, we, we do attract uh, other financing. It's, uh, it's a catalytical effect, the crowding in. Usually, we, we, the amount of the EIB to finance a project is around 30%. It means that if we finance 3 euro, we have the capacity to finance a project of 10. So with, with a 32 billion of investing capacity, we would be in a capacity to mobilize 100 billion each year. And our commitment was for 10 years, it means that for a decade, it's 1 trillion. And we find back these uh, uh, famous figures of uh, what we should require in terms of EU capacity investment, 1 trillion euro for the next decade. So, basically, the Green Deal was a great initiative for the EU 
but we, we have already uh, set up uh, thanks to the IMB and we could be proud of this institution as we were delivering already a um, large amount, big amount and uh, EIB commit itself to, to, um, to double this, this ambition. Eurobonds, how, what's the model of the EIB? Um, we, we say that in 2020, in July 2020, with the recovery plan, uh, it was the first time that uh, all the member states agreed on, on the Eurobonds uh, issuance. It's partially true. It is true if, if we consider this emission as a way to co-finance um, the budget, the national budget. And I will potentially raise a question for Thomas for the next session regarding uh, the, the grants. Uh, in France it's 40 billion. Where does it come from? And what does that mean in terms of new home funds for the EU? Um, so, the IB was actually financing, is financing itself as a bank on the same model. We are insuring every year 70 billion uh, on the market, on the international market, thanks to our shareholder who are the member states. So we were, we are issuing eurobonds. This is the difference is that we are financing projects. We are not supporting the national budget. So the, the mechanism of the eurobonds, I can I can call it a big mutual for the IB, but this is actually the, the, the capacity of the IB is to launch money thanks to the average uh, notation of the 27 member states. We were doing as EU. We, we have, we, we used to have and we still have EU cap financing capacity and we were financing green. So the Green Deal is really a great initiative. It extends this capacity but we are not starting from scratch. And we can be proud that EU were, and you mentioned it before, we, we were financing the environment. We are a step forward in the world in terms of uh, climate change, in terms of financing climate change and it's really important to have an instrument such as the IB to be able to implement what the, all the figures that have been presented uh, like the capacity of an European institution to finance projects and particularly projects with a positive impact on climate change transport, energy transition, building renovation and so on. There, is, there are many projects that could and that are supported today by, by this institution. And thanks to all the financing that has been mentioned previously, even if the IB is not directly part of the, the uh, recovery plan, and the objective of the IB are basically the same as the national uh, recovery plans, um, energy transition, innovation, and this is what we propose to the government, particularly in France, is we are there as an EU institution to support any investment. And I hope that in the next few minutes with President Macron, he will propose a, a kind of a new investment plan for Europe for 2030. It could be a, a proposal, let's see in the next few minutes if we have something. Uh, but there are, there are institutions such as IB, the IB that are ready to do more and that are, that are already financing uh, the climate change. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much to the three of you. So to our very straightforward, simple question, we heard that maybe the Food Recovery Plan might contribute to making the EU greener, not different shades of green, uh, not that intense green, maybe a little bit, uh, and that there are a number of things in place, but that there are also some, a few points that uh, we should think about and watch and be cautious uh, while, while thinking about those. So I think the floor is very much yours for questions, uh, comments. Um, Louise, I don't know if you want to go here and, and sit here in the front. Um, I know the only thing we need to be worried about sorry, are those sorry, uh, cables, but <laughs> apart from that, you may very here and 
Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello. I'm waiting for uh, European Central Study. I'm a PhD, I'm PhD student here. So I have uh, some question. It's more like I'm I'm curious to to know all this uh, invested plan because now uh, I think we talk about a lot of different green investment. But do you have any example for like a national plan or European level plan to see what precisely? these investments are. So for example, they are more focused on transport or uh, infrastructure and building energy, energy transaction. And especially after the 2008, the fi global financial crisis, a lot of government like uh, the France or like the, uh, the, the Dutch, they all invested in green uh, infrastructure. So why is the differences between the, after 2008 and now? And I, so is, is there any uh, more precise investation. And one thing I was thinking is that after the crisis, everyone wants money. So everyone wants investment. So everyone can say we want to be green. For example, like the car infrastructure or the others. So they can use any like excuse to get money. So what is the standard if we want to make the investment to make the recover? And also all this investment for the European banks, they are all in your area. Or is it like more like a global? And one thing I was thinking, like after the crisis, we think about this the kind of market the supply chain. So we use the standard to put like investment to more like locally or more like a regionally instead of to change a little like this uh, transport greenhouse emission. Like anything have changed for the strategy of investment after the crisis. Thank you. And this is all. I try to like mix all the presentation together. Yeah. Thank you. Would you rather collect questions, or would you? What, what do you think? Maybe first answer this one okay. because it's sure. a bit uh, broad. Um, well, since the Netherlands has not submitted a plan, <laughs> uh, it's a bit difficult. But they did make a kind of overview of possible options that could be funded. And what I think is going to happen in the Netherlands is that a lot is going to go to the housing and building sector for the green transition, mm -hmm. but also infrastructure. There are plans in the Netherlands to build a green hydrogen plant in the north of the Netherlands that would cost 10 to 11 billion euros. So I think there is a likelihood that it's also going to be directed towards this uh, huge investment, mm -hmm. or partly. Um, so I expect actually the, the Dutch in, uh, uh, plan to be more green than the 30, way more green than the 37 uh, percent. But um, for the other countries, what I've seen, but maybe Thomas, you would like to add, is that a lot of it is also related to housing, infrastructure, transport sector. Because those are also the sectors where the EU member states have to invest the most. Eh? So if you look at the EU climate change policy, um, actually, this, earlier this week we had a training course at the Climate Institute on, on Europe, and there was a lobbyist from the Dutch uh, airline companies or from the airport. And they were saying, yeah, the EU Fit for 55 package just makes emission reduction policies, but there is no money on offer to to do to make the changes. And I was saying, well, that's not entirely true, you know. <laughs> there is actually a lot of European money becoming available. It's just that maybe your sector doesn't really want to change or is not investing enough itself. But the idea, of course, of the whole climate change policy for a huge part is that you focus on creating emission trading markets and that you focus on bringing emissions down of the big industries that were covered originally by the EU emissions trading scheme uh, and that in that respect the market creates its own incentives to invest but then maybe for some sectors where it's really difficult to get rid of fossil they might need a bit of help you know and, and these recovery funds can be that help for instance to build a uh, a green hydrogen plant so that you can in the future have steel production by green hydrogen instead of by gas and then coal and oil uh, and energy. Um, but um, for the transport and housing sector there will become a new emissions trading scheme uh, was proposed whether it's going to be agreed upon I'm not 100% sure because the French for instance don't seem to like it very much. But if not, then still in these sectors, a considerable emission reduction has to be achieved. And you need the funding because yeah, each and every building that's now heated by fossil needs to be adjusted to uh, an 
another uh, renewable energy source. Each and every car that's on the road needs to be changed, but also each and every uh, lorry or, yeah. So there, it's just a massive transformation that requires a lot of change. Stop here. Um, I think one point that is always important is how we define green. Uh, so currently, I mean, there is not like one single definition. Uh, so I'm, 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 ju I'm just offering you mine. Uh, this is the one that I'm using. Uh, when it comes to climate, at least for me, something is green if it is really aligned with climate neutrality. So if it's an investment that is close to zero net uh, emissions, uh, and that also. Uh, does not significantly harm all the environmental challenges like biodiversity or, or others. Um, <coughs> so if you switch from, yeah, so um, um, yeah, so, uh, I, I won't, I won't go into that. Not, not yet, unless there's a question on the taxonomy. Um, so for instance, if you switch from coal to gas, uh, that's good, but that's not green. Um, so it's a bit as if you know you were you had an alcoholic and he was going to the doctor. And the alcoholic is saying, you know, I'm drinking one one bottle of whiskey every day, and the doctor say, oh, you know, just switch to wine and just drink one bottle of wine every day. That's better, but the person is still an alcoholic in the end. So uh, whiskey being being, you know, the the, the coal in my example, and 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 wine being the being the gas. Um, so yeah, when you look at the details of the plans that have been submitted to the Commission, it's a bit tricky to answer. So first, it really depends on the countries. Uh, some invest more in renewables, at least as part of the plan, some others in buildings. Um, this is not necessarily bad. Uh, the ideal rationale would be, oh, let's seize the opportunity of the recovery to fill in the gaps, to put the money where we actually need it. That would be the ideal. That's not what is happening. Uh, what is happening is they, they, they go for the low hanging fruits. So for instance, the French plan has quite a significant section on uh, housing renovation. Um, and you have two kinds of housing renovation, essentially. You have the small-scale incremental housing renovation. So here we're talking about projects of a few thousand euros. And it's just changing the windows, for instance, at a home. Uh, the French state before COVID was already investing a lot of money there. It was actually investing sufficient money there was one of the few areas where the French state was already investing sufficient money to reach the French climate target. During the recovery, they chose to increase that. When you look at the second kind of uh, investment in housing renovation, it's what we call deep renovation. So you take a crappy building, you fully renovate it, and then in the end it becomes a building that uh, consumes close to zero and sometimes even produces more energy than it consumes. Uh, you can do that, especially actually thanks to a, a Dutch company called the Nagus Point that does that also in, um, in, uh, in, in France. Um, the estimate of the Institute for Climate Economics is that before COVID, uh, France was investing only 5% of what is needed to do deep innovation in France to meet the climate target. And this was not prioritized by the current government in the recovery. The reason for that is that because it's not easy. Uh, and so that's the problem we have a lot with the recovery is that uh, it tends to put more money on the stuff that are easy. I mean, and that's good, huh? but that doesn't solve the, the, the problem. That's why I think we need uh, a longer term investment plan to also uh, yeah, tackle the, the hard stuff. Um, then there's a second question to assess whether this was a genuine, um, um, this, uh, genuinely positive. Uh, is to try to look whether this was additional to national funding or instead of already existing national funding. Uh, and here you can compare France and Italy. Uh, for instance, in France what the government did was to use recovery money to fill a gap that was created by the French state because it chose to decrease public funding for climate uh, over the past five years. So here again, you know, that's good, but that's still, you know, not uh, uh, at a, the right scale to tackle, uh, uh, to tackle the climate challenge. Uh, in Italy, however, we have a different situation where clearly we can say that the EU made a difference and that the EU money is actually used to do stuff that the national government and government will not do otherwise. Uh, and that's called the, uh, the super bonus, as they say in Italy. 
uh, which is a, a pretty phenomenal uh, way of uh, approaching you know, public policy uh, because they say we're going to help you renovate your house we're not going to give you 50% of the cost of the renovation we're not even going to give you 100% of the cost of the renovation we're going to give you 110% of the cost of the renovation so let's say that you have a house in Italy if you want to renovate it, it costs 10,000 euros the Italian government gives you 11 thousand euros. So they actually pay you to do the renovation. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's a good way of <laughs> using public money that begs the question, but it shows that when there is a political will, you can do a lot uh, in terms of... But it uh, is a loan. Uh, it is a loan. Yeah. Um, it's more complex than that. So, so it's something also that has to do with taxes uh, over time. But when you do the calculation, uh, they actually get paid in order to, 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 to renovate. But the renovation money as such is a loan that you have to pay back over the, over the years afterwards. Uh, yeah, and you get a tax credit, tax credit over time, mm -hmm. uh, so you, can, you spend less taxes uh, once you've chosen to do the renovation with the super mm -hmm. And just to complete one, one more question, you had on the uh, activity of the IB. It's 90% inside the EU and 10% outside the EU with specific mandate, uh, neighborhood and Africa, uh, Asia and uh, Latin America. Thank you very much. I, I suggest we connect now. We, do we have two questions because you, you're taking some time to answer, and this is great. But this way, we can we, we should have some questions. Please go ahead. Um, thank you. I'll be brief. I have two questions, yes, but sure. they are for different people. Um, cool. First one on the risks. Where do you see the risks in implementation? I mean, let's say we have plans, but are they within the levels of government? Are they about the knowledge? You said that uh, EIB is very much ahead, and I sometimes wonder how much technical knowledge and where do you need to have it to actually adapt your own particular situation and your own plan, plan to the best possible results, and how I, I imagine EIB helps in that. So, for me, it's important to be governance levels and maybe cooperation private public, and then also the knowledge. And the second quick question for these, if I may, the external dimension of, uh, let's say, the whole Green Deal. What do you think are, or what the studies show, are the most pressing steps or tasks for the EU to mitigate the negative effects on the third parties because of our greening policies? Well, not just aviation and sea band, but mm -hmm. the whole fact that energy security issues. Yeah. Thank you. And so I'll take directly question from Olivier. Yes, so Olivier Zandak from uh, Sciences Po. Um, question about legitimacy, because uh, one reason why the EU is um, helping and uh, subsidizing uh, member states on green uh, issues is, is not only about uh, environmental issues, but uh, in order to, to be more legitimate, having this uh, major objective and uh, mobilizing objective. And uh, well, honestly, when I'm listening to you, to these very complex issues, ways of financing, etc., I have the feeling that it's just impossible that ordinary citizens have the feeling that, well, the EU in the end is a good idea because it helps uh, solving environmental issues. I know it's a big question, but what's your views? Which one of you would like to start? You can start with the risk. <laughs> yes. um, we, we've tried, we are trying in any project we are financing to assess financial risk. This is uh, who the counterpart will pay back to you. This is a classical role of the bank. Um, technical and economic uh, risk uh, is a project relevant for uh, the EU uh, for, for our priorities. As a social aspect and regarding sustainable infrastructure, this is particularly relevant. For instance, wind farms for instance, in France, inshore wind farms, it's no more possible for the time being. It's, it, uh, citizens in France are massively rejecting any new inshore uh, wind farms, whereas in the, in the north of Europe, it's totally different. So there is a question of um, acceptability of this new uh, infrastructure. We are accepting in France nuclear plants, but not wind farm. Uh, uh, in front plan. So then we have to take into account this, this aspect. And, and finally, the environmental risk. 
uh, is the technology that I am proposing, I am fi financing, sustainable for 10, 10, 20, 30 years. And we are trying also uh, to support enterprises that are investing in new uh, innovation proposals, in research and development that are today um, negative, uh, that have a negative impact in terms of climate. Just to, to, to know them, it's, uh, it's Total, it's ArcelorMittal, it's Safran. Uh, this is polluting, this is not uh, neutral in terms of carbon, but we are supporting them to switch and to increase, to uh, and enhance their, their capacity to change their activity and to be more and more decarbonized. And this is potentially the risk, but also the, the great expectations and the hope uh, with this. And there is one uh, technical risk that for the time being, the, I'm still waiting for flagships uh, to, be, uh, to be delivered and implemented. We just financed a, a nitrogen plant uh, in, uh, in Guyana a uh, few, few months ago. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> you can even, like, if you want, like this. Um, so, yeah, so this is a risk. And but it's more a technical uh, risk, and I hope we will have flagship to 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 to, to, to showcase and um, to, to, to to see that this could be a, a solution for the transport of energy. One of the risk also, and um, it's more a, a legal aspect. Um, when you build a new infrastructure, particularly in the energy sector, you are um, uh, taking into account the price that is fixed by the off-taker uh, and potentially by the government. And if 10 years later uh, the government decided to change this price, this is a problem and for all the investors and this could dra 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 dramatically change the um, balance uh, the, of, the, of any project. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe something about the external dimension of the European Green Deal. So the EU is uh, massively investing at home on the green side, but also internationally uh, with regard to the green agenda for the Western Balkans, uh, the getting out of coal in the Western Balkans, Ukraine, now the just transition partnership with South Africa. Uh, but also there will be a new international energy engagement coming out in spring 2022 and there uh, you can also expect way more let's say efforts the global green deal uh, that just was published is also focusing a lot on green and in digital uh, so a lot of efforts also in the EU's external action are going to be transferred into the direction of green and DICI spending, the new Global Europe instrument, needs to be 30, at least 30% green. So in the neighborhood plans, the European investment will probably be more utilized. We, we just published something on, on eu Kazakhstan relations and green energy diplomacy. But there we also noticed, what you, I think, the point that you made. Let's say countries that export a lot of fossil to the EU, EU, and then if you look what, let's say, the implications are of the Fit for 55 package in terms of our reduced the moment of fossil and even more so in the direction of 2050 and imports for instance of green hydrogen might to a certain extent replace that but not probably to the same degree because uh, renewables okay even if the French don't want wind mills on their territory still many more countries can produce renewables making the costs structure of it very different than the old fossil economy so there is really uh, a big difference there, but we have to enter into dialogue over these issues. And CBAM is also, of course, one to the levy that the EU wants to implement at the border uh, for products that are not having a CO2 price like the EU is having. Um, so, yeah, there, there, there is a reason, let's say, to enter into dialogue. And also to strategically think about which energy technologies want, do we want for ourselves and to export and make money out of, because that's in line with the European Green Deal thinking. Or do we want to share it immediately or do we want to do it in a transatlantic context? Well, there's still a lot of open questions also in, in that respect. And then maybe if you allow me on the legitimacy question, 
I think also that climate change policy has been used a lot by the EU and has also become so high on the political agendas because it could be used. Eh? Climate change is something European citizens are concerned about. It's clearly an issue that you have to do together. There is a synergy with the import dependency on fossil that, that the EU wanted to get rid of also for other political reasons. Um, so there is, let's say, a long way that the EU has used climate change policy for legitimizing. But I think there is also the risk there. Um, so because um, now you will see, let's say, that climate change policies will also uh, directly impact on people's life. And there is the risk, you know, of the yellow vests movements, of people becoming angry if the energy uh, at, uh, for gasoline at the pump for car owners or at housing is too expensive, that there's protests. And also previously you saw that climate change, for instance, in the US it's a super divided issue between the right and the left. Huh? So the Democrats and the Republicans, the Democrats are pro-climate change policies, the Republicans are much better. In the European Union this was not the case. Also right-wing conservative parties still considered climate change important. Well, not in all countries, but even in some countries you had populist parties, like in Italy, that were pro-climate. But now I think that's a bit shifted because the more and more, let's say, Fit for 55 will be implemented, the emissions trading scheme for the built environment in the transport sector is, is, is going to be a reality. We already had, you know, in the right wing populist that newspaper in that Europe is going to make your gas price higher you know, this winter. Which is true. Which is also true. Yeah. Um, which is also true, but there is the risk, let's say, that um, that climate change also is going to, to work against the EU at a certain point in time. And I think we have to, we, let's say, as maybe also as Texas community, we have to think about, you know, what this could mean and, and also how we should perhaps also avoid it. My compatriot Timberwolves and all the likes are not overdoing it, the argumentation on, let's say, the benefits of climate change policy. As time is running, maybe Tomei, you want to add a few points and then we'll... Yeah, a uh, few points. Uh, global trading of hydrogen, so far that's a dream, we can't do that physically and we will not be able to do that for best case scenario the next 15 years. Okay. Um, Yellow Vest, they're not an anti-climate movement, they were a social justice movement, this did happen. You know, highly studied by political scientists, you can look at the latest paper by Driscott, so D R I S. C.O.T., uh, who has done extensive sociological research uh, on the movements of the, the Middle West. Finally, um, EU and legitimacy of the Green Deal. Um, I mean, the scenario under which uh, we fail to act on climate change is a scenario where there is, there will be, I mean, uh, I mean, the disintegration of the European Union as a political project just because we will have too many problems to, to, you know, to manage. Uh, migration flows, flooding, etc., etc. Uh, so, so the scenario where we don't act on climate is a scenario of uh, disintegration of the European Union as a project uh, because of the consequences of climate change but also because of the second reason, reason that is key to understand. Um, for the first time ever in EU history, we have a generation of people who are the people currently in their early 20s who are going to be part of the elite, political elite, economic elite, social society elite in the next 10 to 20 years. Their first relation with politics and on climate. That's the first time ever that we have a generation that is politicized because of an environmental issue, not because of you know uh, colonialism or racism or you know social justice or whatever. Um, those people will likely represent around 20% of the population. In 10 years, after the Fit for 55 is implemented, will they perceive the EU as being part of a solution to what is for them uh, the, the challenge of the of this century? If yes, then we can secure a part of the population that is actively in support of the EU because they see the EU as being part of the solution for climate and therefore maybe for other policy concerns. If not, then it could happen what we've already seen with a significant section of the left. We have significant section of the left, people like Jean-Luc Mélenchon for instance, who in the 90s were in favor of the European Union project, but now are actively against it because they perceive it as being part of the problem. So if we act too little, too late on climate, we will fail the great Atomdeg of that world, and they will turn against the EU in 10 years, and I fail to see how the European Union could survive uh, such, a, such a political trend. Thank you very much for the, well, for the engaged conclusion. <laughs> you, you wrote um, with, with politics. Um, I think our panel has come to an end.